we're going to talk about maximal linearly independent subsets. To this end, let's review some ideas from before. Say that we have a vector space V over a field F. Given a finite subset beta, the following two statements are equivalent. First, we have two properties. That is, beta spans V, and beta is a linearly independent set. Second, every element lowercase v can be expressed uniquely as a linear combination of vectors from beta. If either of these properties is true for beta, we say that beta is a basis for our vector space v. Let's assume for the moment that our v is spanned by some finite set s. Then v has a basis beta contained in s, and every basis beta of v has the same number of elements. Using this, given a basis beta of v, we call the dimension of v the number of elements in this basis. Let's try to give some examples now. Let's let v be r2, that is the real plane. Recall that for any non two elements a and b that are not both zero, we can write the following two vectors u1 and u2 that you see here on your screen. The set consisting of these two vectors is a basis for v. In fact, because a and b are pretty much arbitrary, we see that there are infinitely many choices of basis for r2. However, for every such choice, we see that there are only two elements in the set. This means that r2 has dimension 2. Let's try to do the same thing for R3, 3 space. In this case, we found that for any three row numbers A, B, and C, such that A and B are not both 0, we can write down the following three vectors, U1, U2, and U3. We proved here that this set consisting of these three vectors is also a basis, but for V. In this case, a, B, and C are pretty much arbitrary, so we see that there are infinitely many bases for 3 space. However, in each of these choices, there are just three elements, U1, U2, and U3. This means that 3 space has dimension 3. We can write a few more examples here. Let's consider the collection of all m-dimensional vectors, in this case F superscript m. We saw before that this set beta, consisting of the standard basis elements E1, E2, through E sub M, form a basis for this space. In particular, because beta has M elements, we see here that the dimension of V is M, hence the reason why we call this the collection of M dimensional vectors. Finally, let's consider the collection of M by N matrices. We found before that we could write the standard basis in terms of these matrices E superscript IJ, and actually there are M times N of these. This means that our collection of matrices forms a vector space of dimension M times N. Finally, let's take a look at the trivial vector space. That is, this is the vector space that consists of just the zero element. We found before that the empty set is a basis, but the empty set has no elements. This means that the trivial vector space has dimension zero. You'll notice here that the dimension of a vector space is not the same as the number of elements in the vector space. Indeed, the trivial vector space has exactly one element, yet the dimension of the space is zero. The idea is that the dimension doesn't count the number of elements in V, the dimension counts the number of elements in a basis for V. These can be very different sets. Now with all of this, let's try to discuss the concept of a maximal linearly independent subset. Recall theorem 1.7 that gives us a way of determining when a set S is a linearly dependent set. Let's say that T is a subset of a vector space V, which is a linearly independent set. Let's choose a vector, lowercase v, that is not in T, and let's add that to create a set S. Here, if T consists of n vectors, u sub 1, u sub 2, through u sub n, S now consists of n plus 1 vectors, where we have the same n vectors as before, 
but now we just include the vector lowercase v. The statement is, S is a linearly dependent set if and only if this vector v is in the span of t. We're going to come back and use this a little bit later. The next theorem, as a reminder, says that if v is the span of a finite set S, then v contains a basis sitting in S, and next, every basis, beta of v, has the same number of elements. What we're going to do today is relate the existence of a basis for v to that of a subspace w. We have two results that we'll combine together in one. Again, say that v is a vector space, and now let's let w be a subspace. We'll assume that beta is a basis for v. And this beta consists perhaps of these n vectors, u sub 1, u sub 2, through u sub n. We have three statements. First, if v is the span of a, it has a finite basis beta, then every subspace w also has a finite basis. In this case, we'll say that our basis is t. Next, the dimension of w is less than or equal to the dimension of v. What this means is, if beta consists of n vectors, then every basis t of w consists of m vectors, where m is less than or equal to n. Finally, the dimension of a subspace w is equal to the dimension of v, if and only if w equals v as vector spaces. We're going to explain now how all of this works. Let's prove the first statement. We want to consider the following set. This is the collection of integers where this integer counts the number of elements in a linearly independent set T sitting inside of R subspace W. This is a rather strange concept. Again, think of it like this. Start with R subspace W and let's take a look at various linearly independent sets T sitting inside of W. For example, we could say that T here is the empty set. That is a linearly independent subset of W, and the number of elements in T is 0, so the integer 0 exists in this set, script P. So here, again, we take a look at all possible linearly independent subsets T, and now we just simply count the number of elements. Counting the number of elements is what we're putting together to form our set P. We're actually going to prove that every integer m in this set script P is between 0 and the dimension of v. That is, there aren't many elements that this set P can have. We'll try to prove this by contradiction. So let's say that there's some integer m that is not in this range. Well, of course, since m counts the number of elements in the set, there's no way that m can be negative. So m has to be greater than or equal to 0. Since we're trying to do a proof by contradiction, let's assume for the moment that m is greater than the dimension of v. That is, there must exist some linearly independent subset of w that consists of m vectors. Since beta was a basis for v, let's express each of the vectors in t as a linear combination of the vectors here in beta. We can express all of this as a matrix, and since we're assuming that we have more vectors, the w sub m's, than we do these vectors, the u sub n's, that really means that we have a matrix with more columns than rows. And for the moment, we're not really going to explain what all of this means, just that we can find scalars, c sub 1, c sub 2 through c sub m, not all 0, so we can sum this to the 0 vector. This, of course, is a non-trivial expression of the 0 vector, which contradicts the assumption that t is a linearly independent set. Simply put, what we've done here is we've realized that if there really are more vectors, w1, w2 through w sub m, then there are vectors u sub 1, u sub 2 through u sub n, then this means that we can stare at the various coefficients that we had on the previous slide, 
write things in such a way that now we have this non-trivial expression of the zero vector. Since, of course, we have a contradiction, we must conclude that every such m from our set script p is between zero and the dimension of v. This really does mean that our script p is a finite set. Let's denote k as the largest element in this finite set. Of course, k counts the number of elements in a linearly independent set, so let's let t be one such linearly independent set that has k elements. We're going to prove that t is actually a basis for w. That is that t spans w and t is a linearly independent set. Well, by assumption, t is linearly independent, so it suffices for us to prove that t spans w. For the moment, observe that k has to be less than or equal to n because of what we just said. Every integer m in script p must be less than or equal to the dimension of v, and we were assuming to begin with that the dimension of v is just the number of elements in beta, which is n. We already know that the span of t must be contained in w. Again, the directions in t can't be any more than everything that we have for w. So let's assume by contradiction that perhaps span of t does not equal w. What this means is there exists a vector, lowercase v in w, that does not exist in the span of t. Now let's let capital S be t union this vector v. We have to ask the question, is S a linearly independent set or not? Well, let's see. According to a previous result, if S were a linearly dependent set, then v must be in the span of t. That was theorem 1.7. But we just constructed v so that it is not in the span of t, so S must be a linearly independent set. But wait, S is a linearly independent set that is contained in W, and S now contains k plus 1 elements. That contradicts our assumption that k was the largest element in our set, script P. So we have a contradiction in either case. This means that there must not exist an element lowercase v in W that's not in the span of T, hence actually showing that the span of t must be equal to w. Now let's worry about proving the last statement. Well, if w equals v, then the dimension of w must equal to the dimension of v. Let's take a look at the opposite direction. That is, assume that the dimension of w equals the dimension of v. Well, using the ideas above, we can find a basis t of w, and we know that the size of t is equal to the size of our basis beta. What we're actually going to show is maybe t doesn't equal beta, but the span of t does equal to the span of beta. Well, the proof here is very similar to what we had before. Let's assume that the span of t is not v. Then this means we can find a vector, lowercase v and capital V, that is not in the span of t. Once we do this, let's form our set capital S, which is t union this vector lowercase v. And again, let's ask the question, is S a linearly independent set or is S a linearly dependent set? Well, if S were a linearly independent set, then this means that S has n plus one vectors. And so it contradicts our statement before that the number of elements in our script P, that is the size of the elements in our script P, is at most n. So we cannot have a linearly independent set S with more than n elements. So this means that S must be a linearly dependent set. But according to theorem 1.7, if S is a linearly dependent set, then V must be in the span of T. Hence, we actually do see now that the span of T must be v. You'll see in everything that we've worked out here, we actually had a very similar proof by contradiction. The point is that we took a look at this set script p, 
and we tried to take a look at the integers m that correspond to the number of elements in a set T that is a linearly independent subset of W. This subset T that corresponded to when our element in script P is the largest such number is what we call a maximal linearly independent subset. The idea, if you remember how the proof goes, is that if the span of T does not equal to what we want, we then find a slightly larger set S and this set S cannot exist. This is the idea of being a maximal linearly independent set. We're going to use this quite a bit now in trying to discuss a little bit more about bases for subsets. Thanks for listening.